the OECS, represented by Dr. Didacus Jules, Director General. <laughs> Anguilla, Anguilla, represented by Dr. Bonnie Richardson Lake, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Social Development and Education. Antigua and Barbuda, represented by Honorable Daryl Matthew, Minister for Education, Creative Industries, Youth and Sports. Dominica, represented by Honorable Oscar George, Minister for Culture, Youth, Sports and Community Development. Grenada, represented by Ms. Colleen Perriman, Coordinator of Youth, Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports. Montserrat, represented by Honorable Charles Kernan, Minister for Education, Health, Community, Service, Sports, Youth and Ecclesiastic Affairs. St. Kitts and Nevis, represented by His Excellency Kenneth Douglas, Ambassador. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, represented by Honorable Orlando Brewster, Ministry of National Mobilization, Social Development, Family Affairs, Youth, Housing and Informal Tech Settlement. Virgin Islands, represented by Marcia Porter, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, Youth Affairs and Sports.
Anguilla, represented by Dr. Bonnie Richardson Lake, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Social Development and Education. Martinique. Guadeloupe. Presented by Honorable Kenton Casimir, Minister for Youth Development and Sports. The national anthem of St. Lucia will be played by the Royal St. Lucia Police Band. Please remain standing as Pastor Delvin Ford of the Babano Pentecostal Church leads us in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy over our lives. For those who have traveled from far we thank you for your protection that they are here today and father we pray that you bless this meeting of the oecs council of ministers youth and sports and father as this opening ceremony has begun we pray your blessing over this opening ceremony and father whatever has to be discussed and agreed upon may it be for the benefit oh god of all stakeholders and for the member states of the region once again, we ask for your blessings over this. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
My apologies. <laughs> Our protocolist, Honorable Kenson Casimir, Minister of Youth Development and Sports. Honorable Alva Baptist, Minister for External Affairs, International Trade and Civil Aviation. Honorable Moses Jabatist, Minister for Health, Wellness and Elderly Affairs. Honorable Sean A. Edward, Minister for Education, Sustainable Development, Innovation, Science, Technology, and Vocational Training. Honorable Stevenson King, Senior Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Ports, Transport, Physical Development, and Urban Renewal. Honorable Joachim Henry, Minister for Equity, Social Justice, and Empowerment. Our visiting ministers. Honorable Daryl Matthew, Minister for Education, Creative Industries, Youth and Sports for Antigua and Barbuda. Honorable Oscar George, Minister for Culture, Youth, Sports, and Community Development for the Commonwealth of Dominica. Honorable Charles Kernan, Minister for Education, Health, Community Service, Sports, Youth, and Ecclesi Ecclesiastic Affairs, Monstrat. Honorable Orando Brewster, Minister for National Mobilization, Social Development, Family Affairs, Youth, Housing, and Inf Informal Settlement, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Senator the Honorable Shakel Bob, Parliamentary Secretary, Office of the Prime Minister, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Your Excellency, Mr. Kenneth Douglas, Representative of St. Christopher and Nevis. Your Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules, Director General of the OECS, Ms. Augusta de Gazon, Cabinet Secretary, Ms. Mary Wilfred, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, Dr. Bonnie Richardson Lake, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Social Development and Education, Anguilla, Ms. Marcia Porter, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture, British Virgin, Virgin Island, Permanent Secretaries and, Perma and Deputy Permanent Secretaries, Ms. Sursa Simeon, Head of Human and Social Division of the OECS Commission, Chantel Cassette Gaydou, Director of CREPS Guadeloupe, Mr. Joseph Reds Pereira, Honorary Guest, other, vis other visiting Delegates, staff of the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, staff of the OECS Commission, other specially invited guests, members of the media, welcome. Once again, good afternoon. I am Krista Sintaj, author, writer, poet, historian, and this evening, your Chair of Proceedings. Welcome to the opening ceremony of the inaugural meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers, Youth and Sports and to whom, it may, to whom it may apply welcome to St. Lucia. Now, at this time, I have been included in the program outside of all the dignitaries, outside of every official, every official part of this evening, I have been included in my capacity as spoken word artist. And this piece, it speaks to St. Lucian identity, so hopefully the St. Lucians in the room can relate. And I think everybody from the Caribbean is able to relate as well. So this piece, it is entitled, Tell Them. Allow me to take a, a breath. <laughs> Home, land of legacies, legends, and prosperity. We have so much to be proud of, so much to unearth. Mountains break through the clouds again and again. There we go shooting for the stars as if they themselves were already ours, and we know it too. Might as well just paint them yellow, black, white, and blue, because through and through anything illusion put their mind to must come true. So when they tell you life tough and tough it will stay, or that a better day just a little too far away, when they try to put a halt to your freedom song, 
Tell them to want to be free is not dumb. Please do not lose sight. Tell them your rights. Way back, way back then, way back when St. Lucia was a cannon sight, a constant back and forth fight, I imagine the continuous feeling of fright every night. And I can't see it. Her children amongst all of that possibly losing sight, sight of better, something else, something bright, of what is without a doubt and without question. Right. No. I cannot see it. They could not have possibly lost sight. Important things like those don't simply lose value overnight. So when they tell you, the more you fight, the further you get. If it was going to end, why don't end yet? I believe that in a nation like ours, there are some things we cannot afford to forget. Like how having it easy did not simply come free. That there was once upon a time on this very soil, free was a little bit too hard to see for. Free was something we grabbed and held tight. So do not, for the sake of those coming after you, lose sight. When you're shunned and told, that was a long time ago, child, be quiet. Tell them your rights. Arm in arm. I feel like that's something we've always kind of done back when the candlelight was dim and building our nation required a team. Look at us now, living in something we can take pride in. Still, fighting. Because one thing about better, it can always get better. Even now when candlelight is street light and our path is significantly more bright. Sometimes it seems that on some days somehow we sort of lose sight, like we kind of forget to fight when things at home aren't quite right. For just one and for everyone. Guam munek ti mamai sent isi. Mature the way you think and the words you speak. The revolution, our evolution does not end with you and will not end with me. Because one thing about Lucians, before there's a solution for sure, there will be contributions. So when they tell you there's always an exception, that you're dreaming, you're full of it, or you're just an optimist, remind them that although back then our people had too, dignity, equality, fairness, equity, respect, independence are not fundamentally complex. The intention was not for them to be fought for in order to be possessed. Tell them in a nation like ours we cannot afford to lose sight. I imagine, no, I see us continuing the fight with bloodlines like these. There is no maybe, no might. One thing about St. Lucians, we know how to unite, so correct them. No matter how you live, where you're from, or what you believe, don't you dare lose sight. Tell them. Justice, truth, and charity. Our ideal forever be. Tell them. Thank you. <laughs>to kick off the ceremony, I invite Dr. Didikas Jules, Director General of the OECS, to deliver the opening remarks. Let's welcome him. You know, while I set up, perhaps we can give a round in applause to Krista. That was lit, Krista. Lit. Okay, protocol already have been in have been established, having been established. I want to nevertheless welcome all ministers, permanent secretaries, delegates, distinguished guests, all. The revised Treaty of Baste, which is our North Star, in Article 23, Human and Social Development, 23.1, speaks to development and, and adoption of a harmonized common policy for human and social development. It speaks about achieving and surpassing international goals for poverty eradication, for universal primary education, for gender equality and empowerment, for health resilience and environmental sustainability. And it speaks to the effective participation of all sectors of society in decision making at community and national levels. The RTB specifically commits each protocol member state in 23.1F to, and I quote, provide an enabling legislative policy and administrative environment 
needed to support social relations and cohesion for children, youth, men and women in the economic un union area. The concern for social development of the people and youth of our region, while articulated in 2010, has become an increasingly urgent imperative as we are increasingly confronted by internal and external challenges that threaten our very survival as small states in a world of heightened uncertainty and volatility. This is the context that we have come today, in which we have come today to inaugurate the Council of Ministers of Youth and Sport, a pivotal moment in our collective efforts to secure a brighter future for the youth of our region. It is also significant that today coincides with the fifth anniversary of our sister Guadeloupe's accession to the OECS. What are, what are the major challenges that we face in youth development? They span a range of areas from unemployment to youth crime and violence as a public health concern, to the empowerment of indigenous youth to mental health concerns, and far too many students being left behind in educational attainment. All of these issues are interconnected and multidimensional. One deficit leads to another, to other deficits, and the situation becomes a compounded generational crisis. In the face of this, we have designed an approach to youth development that is unique to the OECS, and which is, a, an idea I boast is unique globally, and which is a significant departure from the old prescriptive models of youth development. For too long, youth have been objects of youth development strategies designed by older folk who have not taken enough time to listen, to listen to the problems as perceived and experienced by the youth themselves and to recognize the aspirations that they can articulate for themselves. The OECS approach that, will be, that was presented or will be presented to ministers by the youth themselves is one that has been refined over a couple of years and which draws on the best practices of members, various member states. It is not accidental that we have associated sport with the youth agenda because we recognize the increasing interest of youth in sport. We have noted the spectacular accomplishments being made by our sportsmen and sportswomen. We see the attraction of popular sports to youth who otherwise would have been at risk. And the world of sports has created a virtual global arena of economic opportunity. Let us be clear that the association of the youth and sports portfolio does not mean that we view sport as an exclusive domain of youth. To the contrary, we believe that sport would be a whole of society, should be a whole of society lifestyle endeavor of benefit to young as well as old, to all genders, to all classes, and a basic social foundation for healthy and vivacious living. So for us, sport is a vehicle for social development as well as economic advancement given the extraordinary talent that we see being unleashed in and beyond the field. We recognize the capacity of sports to foster personal development, community engagement, and societal advancement. Allow me to quickly list the opportunities that transcend the boundaries of traditional athletic training. And they include investments in sustainable initiatives such as sports management and administration programs providing educational pathways for youth interested in the administrative aspects of sports, such as event management, marketing, and governance. We have noted considerable progress in many member states in the strengthening of the administration and programming of sporting associations. And we would like to encourage the formation of not only national, but OECS associations of various sporting disciplines. Secondly, sports journalism and broadcasting, creating avenues for aspiring journalists and broadcasters, inspired by the legendary Reds Pereira, to cover sporting events, thereby amplifying the reach and the impact of sports beyond the field. 
There is legacy here that needs to be celebrated and emulated. And we will be paying effusive homage to Mr. Reds Pereira, who has made and continues to make in his own way an incalculable contribution to sports development and journalism in the OECS. We also believe that the popularization of sports is essential. Sport requires audience. An audience needs a communication infrastructure as the vehicle to carry the excitement to our homes, our watering holes, our lazy couches. And this is why we will be pushing for support for an indigenous OECS dedicated sports channel that will showcase and inspire our own. We cannot continue to digest foreign television and social media while neglecting our own. Mr. Brian Bartlett of Winners TV, who has taken the brave entrepreneurial step, putting his money where his mouth is, will be given an opportunity to present to ministers in this meeting. Then there's the area of sports science, ensuring that our athletes are up to date with current training protocols, testing, and preparation for the enhancement of human performance. Here again, we need to make fullest use of facilities available in the OECS, starting with CREPS, the Center for Sports Resources, Expertise, and Performance, which is an Olympic high-performance facility in Guadeloupe. And the representatives are here and most welcome. And the St. Lucia Sports Academy, and then ultimately embracing any other centers of sporting specialization in other member states. There's sports medicine and rehabilitation, supporting training programs for healthcare professionals, specializing in sports medicine, ensuring the holistic well-being of athletes and enthusiasts alike. Sports technology and innovation, encouraging innovation in sports equipment, analytics, and virtual training platforms, thereby enhancing performance and accessibility. Uh, it would be good to know that just a couple months ago we had a visit from a Finnish delegation and they have made, they have, we've had discussions with them about the provision of computerized high performance training equipment that could be made available in the OECS. And finally, exports. Recognizing and investing in the growing field of competitive gaming, which not only offers career opportunities for players, but also encompasses aspects of sports management, broadcasting, and technology. In all of this, we must prioritize empowering youth to become active participants in shaping the future of sports and society. This entails youth representation in decision making, ensuring that youth voices are not just heard, but actively incorporated into the decision-making processes of sports organizations, as well as governing bodies of all kinds. Facilitating grassroots initiatives that can use sports as a tool for social cohesion, fighting crime, youth mentorship, and community development. On the good in all of this is our approach and the structures that we have been building for youth development. The YES initiative, which is both YES as in YES, Youth Empowered Society, YES, Youth Engaged Strategy, has been elaborated and is being managed by the Youth Advisory Network, a body of the most energized, articulate, and committed youth in the OECS, and many of them are represented there. Maybe you should stand to be recognized. Hello, don't be shy. <laughs> Where are the other reps? I think there are some other reps around. I want to publicly thank them for the dedicated and extraordinary work that they have persistently pursued with no compensation other than the joy of their accomplishment and the assurance of the autonomous future that they are defining. A powerful tool that we have used in collecting data that was needed was provided by UNICEF and the OECS as one of the first regions in the world to access and utilize this mobile tool. UReport OECS has been an indispensable development tool, providing information in real time through polls, the results of which have been utilized by various stakeholders 
to inform their respective policies and programs as they seek to create relevant youth-focused initiatives. This tool is now available to our governments as a vital conduit to connect with youth opinion and sentiment. I don't know if you're aware of the statistics, but in the OECS, we have two point something phones to every member of the population. Thank God we only have two ears, maybe we would have had four phones. <laughs> a milestone in the evolution of our ministerial councils was created in Antigua and Barbuda in 2023, when under the chairman, under the leadership of Minister Darian Matthews, who's here, who was then chairman of our Council of Education Ministers, a decision was taken for the inclusion of youth representatives as part of ministers' delegations to council meetings. This has created a precedent for us to encourage host countries to invite various stakeholders, including youth and student bodies, sports coaches, young athletes as observers, and to contribute to the discussion, voice concerns, and make recommendations in a structured manner. And we intend to extend this best stakeholder engagement practice to all our ministerial councils. Given the challenges that we all face with disturbing involvement of youth in crime, we continue to work with our development partners to diverting, rehabilitating, and reintegrating youth who are in conflict with the law. USAID has provided support in successive projects focused on this critical area, and we are hopeful that the new OASIS, the Opportunity to Advance Support Youth for Success project, will show great results and strengthen the efforts being made by our governments on this front. In closing, permit me to express our sincere thanks to our host member state, St. Lucia, the government of St. Lucia for its willing hospitality, and especially to Minister Kenson Kasimi for his persistent, I might say almost peaceful and insistent call for convening such a ministerial. Deservedly, deservedly, he assumes the inaugural chair of this council. Deepest gratitude is also extended to the Center for Sports Resources, Expertise, and Performance, Kreps of Guadeloupe, and our development partners, by the way, with whom we will be in the course of this meeting signing an MOU, so that the center will be available for all Olympic teams in the OECS in preparation for the next Olympics. With express the zeal, with express the zeal and talk of other ferries coming on stream, it will be easy and cheap to sail across to, Mar to Guadeloupe. And also thanks to our development partners, to UNICEF, USA, the European Union, who's represented here by Dr. Boyce, the Caribbean Development Bank, the ILO, the World Bank, and the Global Partnership for, uh, for Education for their ongoing collaboration in youth, sports, youth and sports-related endeavors. I thank you, and we look forward to a highly successful meeting. Thank you, Dr. Jules, for contextualizing the Council of Ministers Youth and Sports meeting. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Michael Fletcher to do a musical rendition entitled Dej Moore by Joseph Ives Simeon, a traditional violinist from the village of Labry. Michael is a self-taught musician and a student of the Schwozel Secondary School. Let's welcome him to the stage.
Like Mr. Shakespeare said, if music is the food of love, play on. <laughs> Unfortunately for us at this time, only one piece is, it has to be satisfactory. But Michael, thank you. I am indeed, yes, one more time, yeah. I am indeed honored at this time to introduce our next speaker, Honorable Kenton Casimir, St. Lucia's Minister for Youth Development and Sports and Chair of the Council of Ministers, Youth and Sports. He will address us now. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Mistress of Ceremony. Protocol already established. Let me recognize my cabinet colleague, the Honorable Joachim Henry, the Minister for Equity and Parliamentary Representative for Castries Southeast. Let me also recognize my ministerial colleagues, uh, my compatriots in this endeavor, ministers from the OECS countries, uh, let me also recognize uh, Dr. Didicus Jules, who is one of the most potent instruments you could use in the fight to ensure we have uh, all sorts of development in St. Lucia and, of course, indeed the region. Put your hands together for him, an absolute resource for all of us. Let me also recognize excellencies of the diplomatic corps. The Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, and other staff I also see many well wishers, sports enthusiasts. President of the St. Lucia Olympic Committee, Mr. Alfred Emanuel, is in our midst. Joseph Freds Pereira, honored today, our honored guest today, tonight. Other staff at the ministry, staff of the OECS Commission. Special invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is an honor and a privilege to address you this evening and to welcome you most cordially to the official opening of the inaugural meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers, Youth and Sports. I must express my appreciation to the OECS Commission for choosing our beautiful island, the Helen of the West Indies, to host this meeting, which fittingly makes me the chair of the council. I must also applaud my team from the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports for their enthusiasm and assistance in collaborating with the planning team at the commission. Additionally, I wish to commend the prime minister and the cabinet for agreeing to St. Lucia hosting this meeting. It is an opportune time in our history for policymakers at the highest level in the Eastern Caribbean to discuss pertinent issues facing the most energetic and vibrant sector of the population. And by this pronouncement, I refer to our young people. During this strategic meeting, as evidenced by today's proceedings, a conscious effort is being made to integrate youth and sports, a combination that would be would hopefully bear fruits that are sustainable, inclusive, diverse, impactful, and enjoyable. The theme for this meeting is beyond the field, ensuring sustainable impact and legacy of OECS youth. I will try through my personal experience and through the retrospect of what happens in St. Lucia to reveal the importance of this topic and suitable actions that must be taken to see it to fruition. Robert Kennedy once said, this world demands the qualities of youth, not a time of life, but a state of mind, a temper of the will, a quality of imagination, a predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over the love of ease. It was in June 1966 that he appealed for the empowerment of the youth to become a reality. Today, in 2024, these words are even more powerful and inspiring. They remind us of the potential and strength of youth in our changing world. 
The theme calls for promoting youth mainstreaming in policy decision-making processes in the OECS and acknowledges that the participation of young people is an essential condition in the political, economic, and social processes in order for them to trust and believe in the work of our institutions. It is fundamentally important to have youth engagement and participation in various developmental issues. The young people, they are a major human resource for development. They are key agents for social change, economic growth, and technological innovation. Participation in decision-making should be a key priority area of our agenda. It is indisputable that the current times are unprecedented and filled with confusion and uncertainties. With the regional and global impact that the COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges of climate change, economic uncertainty, social and economic displacement, and growing up in the context of an aging population, the time is ripe to engage the youth, to identify innovative solutions to the intricate problems facing our region. For all of these problems, there are no easy or quick solutions, but success can only be achieved by creating safe platforms and nurturing their talents, creativity, and potential. Our youth are undaunted and have expressed a keen desire to be part of the solution. They are very much seized with the issues of today, and they know that the solutions that they can contribute to will make an impact in their lives, in their lives tomorrow. Young people have extremely strong values of tolerance and social cohesion. They aspire to a life of dignity for all. They are committed to peace. They are champions for development and change in communities and societies. They are essential contributors to conflict prevention and peace building. 46% of the world's population is under 25 years old, which is the highest in human history. That's according to the World Bank in 2017. Therefore, we have to understand that in such demographic realities, the youth hold an enormous potential for change and positive action. Too often, young people are painted with a brush of indiscipline and accused of being responsible for the malaise of social problems. Opposing this false narrative is our responsibility as the state of our nation's youth in microcosm greatly reflects that which exists in our wider society. I am convinced that the youth are already leaders of today and they need and deserve a place at the decision-making table. I challenge us to an urgent call to action a call that transcends borders and resonates across our shared commitment to the well-being and development of our youth. It is time for us to unite in the pursuit of professionalizing youth work, fostering positive youth development, and catalyzing collaboration and investment on a regional level. Professionalizing youth work is not a singular endeavor. It is a shared responsibility that demands our collective attention. By standardizing qualifications, providing ongoing training, and establishing a framework for excellence, we can ensure that those entrusted with the care and guidance of our youth are equipped with the skills and knowledge necessary to make a lasting impact. A regional approach allows us to tap into the collective wisdom of our diverse cultures and find innovative solutions that transcend geographic boundaries. As a region, we need to take back our young people from the snares and the wickedness of criminal elements. We need to take back our current generation from a few thugs that have caused them to identify themselves by the numbers six and seven. We need to strategically diminish the appeal of those numbers to our young people by encouraging them to glorify and embrace the number one. So instead of only being reactive and investing in law enforcement and modern legal proceedings, we need to couple these initiatives with proactive efforts targeted at this and future generations' minds. You see, the good book explores 
it, the good book implores us to be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so, as the chair of this organization, the proactive efforts on youth involvement in crime will be targeted at their minds. Through a Project One campaign, we will ask young people to not see themselves as six or seven, but we will ask them to declare themselves as one. Instead of stating publicly that they are six or seven, this campaign will promote young people seeing themselves as one in a million. With this campaign, we'll get the biggest social media influencers, musicians, youth leaders, and sports personalities to endorse the promotion and encourage the young people to look within and declare that I have a contribution to make to my country, to declare that I could apply myself in achieving my dreams, that I can contribute positively to society. I, Kenson Kazemi, I'm not six. I'm not seven, I'm one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this inaugural meeting of ministers of youth and sports is both timeless and timely. Timeless in that it revisits the recurring issues of the need for greater investments in youth and sports. It is timely in that the recent World Championship medals won by both St. Lucia and Dominica in the persons of Julian Alfred and Thea Lafon should serve as the impetus for the OACS leaders to call for an OACS championship games. In the past, we had the sports desk. However, relegating a single desk at the commission to sports will produce the result, will not produce that, the results that we yearn for. What we need is a well-resourced mechanism that would organize the OACS games or championships to provide athletes with a platform to showcase their talent and provide the citizens with the opportunity to witness and enjoy sports at the highest level. From 2008, sports journalists and sporting organizations like the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Olympic Committee have been pleading for CARICOM to establish an Olympic Committee to establish a regional sports development commission to maximize regional growth in sports and foster sports research and innovation to keep the Caribbean at the forefront of the evolving trends of technologies. The OECS have proven to be the envy of the rest of the Caribbean in terms of our ability to unite and deliver our collective agreements. I believe this is the appropriate time to make sports development a priority in the OECS. We need to dedicate resources to sports in our region, enhance infrastructure, provide historic or holistic talent development, and strategic partnerships to propel OECS sports to new heights. There is a wealth for sporting talent in the OECS. If properly developed, it can reshape the landscape of sports in the entire Caribbean. The future of sports in the Caribbean should be driven by the very individuals it aims to serve. Sporting ministers and governing bodies should actively seek the perspectives of young athletes, the technical officials, administrators, and community leaders by creating platforms for open dialogue and meaningful participation. I'm elated that tomorrow history will be made as the policymakers at the highest level will be meeting with the sports fraternity to discuss the future of sports in the OECS, a trend that must be emulated and continued. Ladies and gentlemen, the cry for greater investment in youth and sports seem to resonate in all corners of our society. If we are serious about tackling the problems in our region, it is vital to prioritize involvement of young voices in decision-making processes. When youth lack opportunities, they are more easily led to crime and violence and other deviant behaviors descending into slippery slopes to the bottom of the social scale. Failing to invest in our youth is a false economy. Conversely, investing in young people will pay great dividends for all. Because by playing sports, young people can achieve something more than trophies and more than medals. They can rise up to become champions of their own lives and score goals for development. If we think we have invested wisely and responsibility, responsibly sorry, in today's youth, 
and it's not too much to expect a good return on our investment, which will be a manifestation of the legacy of OECS youth. Sports can propel. Sports can transform the OECS region, and it also serves as a major commodity for economic activity. During our interactions at this inaugural meeting, we hope that policymakers advocate for sports to catapult us into a new and improved dimension of economic activity. Our young people are eagerly watching. Our athletes are on the starting blocks. They are yearning for an enabling environment that will steer the generation beyond the field, where they desire to make a lasting impact in this treasured space of the OECS. Let's get it done for them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister, for this very passionate presentation on the need for inclusivity and mainstreaming youth in policy decision making. Indeed, the youth are the leaders not only of tomorrow, but also of today. At this time, a very special presentation will be made. I invite Mr. Terry Finiste to take us to this next item on the program. Terry Finiste is an award-winning writer and commentator writing for World Athletics, FIFA, FIVB, Norseca, FINA, FI and FIBA, and covering events including the Commonwealth Youth Games, Carifta Games, and World Championships for regional and international media. He is a track and field coach and a technical official, as well as an administrator currently serving as public relations officer for the St. Lucia Aquatics Federation, and also as a director of Sports St. Lucia Incorporated. Let us invite him to the stage. Thank you very much, Madam Mistress of Ceremonies. Protocol having been established, let me nonetheless recognize Director General, Your Excellency, Dr. Didicus Jules, uh, Honorable Kenson Casimir, Minister for Youth Development and Sports here in St. Lucia, and all the ministers for youth and sports from across the OECS. This is indeed an auspicious occasion the gentleman we are honoring today is someone that I am prouder than I think he knows to call a friend. I don't think he realizes how much I look up to him um, in the years that we have known each other um, since I was but a lad, as he would say. Um, Joseph Reds Pereira is on the verge of his 85th birthday by the grace of God. He is known to and revered by cricket fans worldwide. Here in the Eastern Caribbean, of course, we have laid claim to him as our own. Let me tell you a story of an overcomer, the story of a man truly crafting his own legacy. Reds, as I think would be public knowledge, born in rural Guyana, he says that when he moved to Guyana, to Georgetown rather, at the age of six, he was somewhat intimidated, awed by the city. From childhood, he was a stammerer, but he did not let that define him. And I'm sure for people who don't know the background, it might surprise you to discover that Reds Pereira, whom we've been listening to on television, on radio for decades, up until about what, the age of 20 or so Reds, was a stammerer. He actually had a debilitating stammer. Reds though defined himself just as I grew up listening to him on shortwave radio, as I suppose many um, young men of my age in particular would have grown up listening to him from the far-flung corners of the world, broadcasting West Indies cricket, so too did he follow the exploits of the great West Indies teams of yore, yearning to be part of that greatness. But inasmuch as he played a bit in his youth, it was not as a player that Reds aimed to make his mark. Living in Europe, but nowhere near any organized cricket per se, he stood before his mirror, practicing his own cricket commentary, growing in confidence, and perfecting his craft. Rez would go on to narrate entire games to himself. You had an audience, Red? Your mother, his mother. <laughs> so Red spent years narrating his own cricket games to himself. 
How long has it been since he was first handed a microphone? When Res Perel first provided commentary for cricket, it was between British Guyana. I don't have that anymore. Trinidad and Tobago were their opponents. That was in 1951. Ten years later, he did his first tests between West Indies and India at border. When Reds retired from cricket commentary in the mid-2010s, I should say from maybe test cricket commentary because he still does, um, he still does us the honor of commenting on our, um, our SPL and so on, um, which we are very pleased to have him be part of. His voice since then has been known by hundreds of millions, having covered 152 test matches over 200 one-day internationals, five World Cups, most notably, of course, the West Indies triumphs in the 1970s, where he did, I think you would have done the final red in that World Cup. I was not um, listening, eh, by the way, just before, you know, he tried to start calculating my age. I was a little bit too young for cricket at the time, I must say. But um, he has too many first-class matches to count. In this corner of the world, though, we have taken Reds in as one of our own. He was invited many moons ago, way back in 1984, to create the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Sports Desk, to work as a sports coordinator with federations across the subregion, to build their programs, to reinforce their administrative practices, to develop champions. He spent 12 years at the sports desk molding it, building it in his own image. In that time, we saw the emergence of numerous champions, uh, numerous championships. Volleyball, track and field, netball, table tennis, basketball, so many more. Many of these competitions, or several, I should say, of these competitions persist to this day. OECS swimming started in hotel pools in Grenada, and St. Lucia has produced Olympic qualifiers, dozens of scholarship athletes. We've seen in swimming, in a track and field, obviously, the exploits, as the minister recently mentioned, of our two OECS champions at the World Indoor Championships, the likes of Grenada's Kirani James, Anderson Peters, going on to conquer the world, Laverne Spencer, um, so many other great champions coming out of the organization of the Eastern Caribbean states. Might it have been possible without the intervention of the sports desk? Perhaps. But the role that was played by the sports desk in enabling and growing sports in those years that Reds was there leading that charge cannot be discounted. The example that Red set with little more than a shoestring budget and a massive injection of enthusiasm and love for sport and for sports personalities is one that many of us would do well to follow. More years ago than I care to remember, he granted me a brief interview in Barbados. I think it was during a test match at Kensington. I left that interview with some of the best advice I have received in my career about preparation, research, attention to detail, and I think most crucially, most crucially, about brevity of questioning. Because I think I asked Red some long-winded question that took about five minutes. And he told me, Don't, no, no, just ask the question and let the questioner answer you. <laughs> so thank you for that, Red. Your advice back in the 90s sticks with me and guides me to this day. Your passion for sport, for national development, for the development of our people remains strong. Stronger clubs, more media coverage, better coaching, a number of the interventions that you heard Dr. Jules and Minister Kazmir talking about. Using sports to better engage potentially at-risk youth. Don't get red started on how we can improve sports in St. Lucia, in the OECS. Not unless you have a half hour, 45 minutes to spare. <laughs> because he will take up the rest of your day. The OECS is working on a special feature unlocking the evolution of the sports desk under its inaugural coordinator. Before we make a special presentation to Reds, let's share with you a snippet from that upcoming project which I think we have lined up. And it To and rock a gentleman at the, the other end of the phone, the other end of the phone, introduced himself as Dr. Von Lewis, 
as the Director General of the OECS. And he said that um, you are one of the names which has been suggested to head the OECS uh, first ever sports desk. And would you be interested? Now, um, you don't have half an hour to find out about, you know, all sort of things about conditions and, you know. You had two or three minutes. I mean, a director general is calling you. Your answer is either yes or no. And I said yes. Because just about every event to me well, 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 was important and important to whatever discipline, you know, we, we were trying to focus on. To tell you the truth, I mean, people make much of, you know, you being a commentator and talking to millions of people and all that. That's the easy part. But the OECS, the OECS appointment was the greatest challenge in my life. Yes, certainly a round of applause for Joseph Reds Pereira. We give Reds his flowers and lay claim to him as a St. Lucian and an OECS man. We are pleased to present him at this time with a painting by one of our fine artists, Mr. Jonathan Gladding. And let me share with you at this time as we bring the painting across, Mr. Gladding's words to Reds. First, I would like to congratulate Reds for a remarkable career that has touched the lives of so many. It was an honor and a pleasure to do this painting for you. It made me think about how it takes me hours and hours to create an image like this. Whereas you can paint a scene in real time with words extemporaneously, keeping listeners just riveted and engaged as they would be if they were right there on the cricket pitch. So I offer this painting as an artist who works in paint to an artist who works in words. This particular match took, part, took place at La Fague Choselle. If you look very closely, there is a rendering of you in the background, watching, perhaps commentating. I took the liberty of adding you to the painting as a way of suggesting your presence in Caribbean sport, which has become ubiquitous, thanks to your decades of hard work, professionalism, and dedication. Thank you for bringing athletic events to us in a way that only you can, and elevating sport and culture in the process. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Reds Pereira, first OECS sports coordinator. Good evening. Good evening. And for the person who created 
that protocols has already been established. Thank you very much for that person who did that. Because it has helped thousands of people. Because to have the repetitiveness, I think that was brilliant. In the words of the late great Severton de Courcy Weeks, he once told me, Reds, it's nice to be remembered. And when people remember you, appreciate it. Thank you to the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. I left that as I drove away from the Morn head office on the 16th of December, 1996. And since then, I've always held the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States close to my heart. I had the honor of working in another island with the Director General when he was working in another area of, of uh, education. And since, <laughs> well, today is just the anniversary of that a beautiful island like St. Lucia, like the rest of the, of the OECS, is the fifth anniversary of Grenada. Right. Um, I don't have 20 minutes of commentary for any test match here tonight, but a couple of takeaways I'd just like to, uh, to zero in on. Um, The idea of a special sports channel. We have many boxing matches, many basketball games, many netball games, uh, many football games, and I can go on, which are recorded in its entirety. And we turn on our televisions at night, and we'll see three minutes of that event. What has happened to all that material? Where does it go? It goes nowhere. We should have a dedicated channel in the OECS when we have all these major uh, events for it to be put on, not just the two minutes on whichever television station you might be watching, but let us use the material which is there which does not cost, whether it can go on the GIS, whether it can go on commercial televisions, I do not know. Um, I'd like to do a takeaway um, from the Honorable Kenton Casimir. Um, when I listened to his speech, he really re reminded me how basic we were in 1984. The only technical piece of equipment I had was a fax machine. There was no Google, no smartphones, no WhatsApp. You had to really use the one thing that was there to provide the kind of communication in the OECS that was important. So what was happening in BVI Everybody knew thanks to the fax machine. What was happening in Grenada, everybody knew because of the fax machine. So things were tough then, but I'm very happy that all the OECS ministers have the kind of technology uh, that the OECS uh, staff in 1984 did not have but did a great job in establishing the organization of Eastern Caribbean states. And I want to thank Dr. Vaughn Lewis for giving me a, a free hand, not looking over my shoulder. You're here to do a job, Rez, go ahead and do it. And I must say that the media in the OECS, the media in the wider Caribbean played a major role the individuals who then headed the various ministries, the directors of sport. And I've made a little note here, because I want to be thankful to these people. Some have gone to the great beyond, 
Some are still with us. St. Kitts, Mr. Sweeney. Grenada, Mr. Greenwich. Antigua Barbuda, Mr. Samuels and Mr. White. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Mr. Hudson. Dominica, Heavy Schilling Ford and Mr. Sarvin. The BVI, Mr. Penn. Montserrat, Mr. Boxel. And I left the first point of contact with St. Lucia when I came here. Mr. Aldick Isaacs, who was then the PS Ministry of Sport. Could we put our hands together for those people? <laughs> if it wasn't for the media, if it wasn't for the sports officers, if it wasn't for the prime ministers, if it wasn't for the private sector, we could not have had a development at the sports desk. I must tell you that the game of cricket helped the sports desk a, a great deal. Because I was known, I was able to knock on doors and help came. But I will be making a challenge to the ministers. Political parties, trade unions, church groups are strong because they have cells working. They're not strong because they have a cathedral or they have an office in, 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 in the city. And I'm leaning towards saying that unless we build from the ground up, we can build many stadiums, we can build many facilities, we can have all, all the technology. We need to build from the ground up. And unless we empower the clubs, unless we give the clubs a simple constitution which of acts uh, their Sharon to s s share with all our ministers, unless we have a club structure which is strong, a club structure with a non-playing executive, not one president and a hard-working secretary. It doesn't work that way. We need to build a club structure Strong clubs make strong associations. Strong associations make a strong Olympic Committee. It is not reinventing the wheel. It's the only way up. The only way up. It will have an impact on the unemployed. It will have an impact on the boys and girls on the bridges because they have something to belong to. Every little club in every village of the OECS needs to have a club structure. So it has to be tackled. It cannot be ignored. It must be tackled or else you would not make the development. It don't care how much money was spent. It is really almost tearful just a few short weeks ago to see that two members of the OECS, two athletes, bring home two gold medals to the region. There are many European countries who left Scotland without a medal. And the OECS had two gold medals. <laughs> There's so much to be proud about. So I focus on the need, I challenge the sports minister, I challenge the chair to focus on the development of the club structure. And I think Sharon kindly shared with each minister here, each permanent secretary here, a copy of the club structure. I shall be a little bold before I close. And forgive me if I might not be politically correct. We train, you look at television at night, we train so many parts and parcels of our society. We train nurses, we train teachers, we train police officers, we train customs officers. You know the gambit. 
but we need to start training our coaches. The only way we're going to produce more Alfreds and more LaFons is by empowering our coaches. The only way we can empower our coaches is if we create a program to lift the standard of our track and field coaches, our volleyball coaches, our basketball coaches, and it means that the Olympic committees of the OECS has got to put aside a special amount of money to bring in people to create that empowerment, to create the betterment, to create the skills of our coaches. If you have better coaches, you have a higher standard. If you do not improve your coaching, you will continue to produce here and there. But if you have a strong empowerment of coaches, you will have the requisite standard in the, at the youth level, at the club level, at the national level, etc. So I'm appealing to the ministers to have dialogue with the Olympic committees of the sub-region to see if we can have a focus on empowering our coaches. That to me is the only way we're going to really lift the standards. A club structure, national association becoming stronger, Olympic committees becoming stronger, and your coaches working in the schools, working with youths, lifting uh, the standards. Um, the night is a very moving night for me. It's not easy to stand here and not feel like shedding a tear. But big men don't cry. <laughs> big men don't cry. Terry touched and a part of my life, um, which was almost like a nightmare. It's a terrible, a terrible problem of being a stammerer. I never, ever believed that I could ever have become anything near a, a commentator. But my mother believed in fantasy, and I used to lie in bed and do boxing for Madison Square Garden, Adela and Joey Jordan and Brazil playing England at Wembley and all the cricket matches possible. And slowly but surely, I was over, able to overcome it. When I told a certain country that I was going to St. Lucia to work for the OECS, they said, what? You leaving here to go to St. Lucia? Brothers and sisters, that's the best decision I've made in my life. <laughs> the cricket commentary was not really challenging. If you do your homework, if you do your research, the players are there, you know who's bowling. It's Walsh or Zambros, it's, you know, Marshall Hall. But the OECS sports desk was challenging but it was the most satisfying job in my entire life. To the organization of Eastern Caribbean states, I say thank you very much. And it's nice to be remembered. And I want to ask the sports minister to remember my challenge. Constitution for every little club in any little village. They need something to govern them. And we need to train our coaches. Empower our coaches and we'll have greater standards, a number of stars coming through. Thank you very much. I'm sorry it was a little long, but I must apologize. I must be a very special person to have two outstanding solutions <laughs> taking me off the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Finiste, and congratulations, Mr. Pereira. The OECS is indeed very grateful for your years of dedicated service.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Royal Senusha Police Band will now captivate us with a rendition of local music. Another round of applause for the rousing performance by the best police band in the OECS, the Royal Senusha Police Band. <laughs> um, I apologize on behalf of the Prime Minister, who is out, on, out of state on official business at, this, at present. So we move right along. For our final presentation this evening, I call on the Silver Shadow Dance Academy to put on a cultural presentation of traditional music and dance. Let's welcome them to the stage. Yep, to the front.
Thank you, Silver Shadow Dancers, for this pulsating performance, a fusion of Afro, Caribbean, French, and of course, our ever popular Denry segment music genre of St. Lucia. Finally, for this evening, I invite Mr. Rohan Lubor, St. Lucia's Director of Youth Development in the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, to deliver the expressions of gratitude. Let's grant him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I would like to adopt the protocol that has already been established. And I'm very honored to be here this evening to deliver the expressions of gratitude, known as our vote of thanks. It is with great pleasure I stand before you this evening to express our gratitude to all who were tasked with organizing such a momentous occasion. First and foremost, I would like to highlight and sincerely thank the government of St. Lucia, the Prime Minister and his cabinet for grabbing the opportunity to host this inaugural meeting of the OECS Council of Ministers, Youth and Sports. <coughs> This undertaking is not only timely, but also serves as a platform for local and regional development in relation to youth and sports, which from time to time may be overlooked by some of our leaders. We all will agree that the youth is our now, which shapes our future. And the role of sports, recreational and social activities definitely help to shape attitudes and to pave the way for progress. Special thanks to Pastor Delvin Ford for blessing our ceremony in a moment of reflection and guidance. You have provided, you have provided us with the necessary spiritual tools to navigate the path that lies ahead. Your prayer has provided a sense of purpose and unity as we embark on our journey ahead. We also extend our gratitude to Dr. Didicus Jules Director General of the OECS for his warm welcome remarks. Setting the stage to ensure that this inaugural meeting fulfills its objectives. Your insight and leadership are invaluable and we are honored to have, you support, to have your support in steering the course of action. We are privileged to have with us serving as chairman of the council, the not so young but definitely vibrant, our very own Minister for Youth Development and Sports, the Honorable Kenson Kazime. Thanks for your words of wisdom and for sharing your opinions, ideas, and your passion for youth and sports development. You are a living example of the tremendous positive impact sports can have on the lives of young people. We appreciate the extensive work you have done within your ministry and by extension, your country. May we look forward to your guidance, perseverance, and labor for many years. We would like to express our gratitude, our appreciation to the Royal St. Lucia Police Force for gracing us with the rendition of the national anthem and a captivating musical interlude your performance has imbued this ceremony with a sense of pride and patriotism. It's a round of applause, yes. And of course, we can't at all omit such a captivating musical piece performed by Mr. Michael Fletcher. A round of applause for Mr. Fletcher, yes. Your inner talent and dedication to the arts have added a touch of elegance to this ceremony, and you truly provide a sense of hope and encouragement to our youth. We extend our gratitude to the Silver Shadow Dance Academy for your fascinating cultural presentation. Your performance did not only entertain, but has showcased the rich cultural diversity that makes the OECS region unique. Recognition must be given to the media representatives and journalists who are here this evening, as well as those who will continue to cover the event. Your role in spreading the message of youth empowerment and sports development is invaluable. You are a critical component 
in our quest to, uh, to achieve our mandate. Thanks to Mr. Terry Finister, my comrade, classmate, for providing us with a comprehensive citation, ensuring that all boundaries were well covered as we honored our stalwart, Mr. Joseph Reds Pereira. And of course, a well-played innings by Reds, ending the day's play on 84 not out due to poor light conditions. <laughs> However, play resumes tomorrow as he will take the crease to head for his century. A round of applause to, I should say, Dr. Joseph Reds Pereira. <laughs> Thank you, Reds, for all you have done for our region. You are very much deserving of the accolade of the you are very much deserving, sorry, of the accolades showered upon you this evening and prior. May your legacy live on. To our wonderful mistress of ceremony, Ms. Krista Setage, you executed your duties remarkably. Your poise and experience provided a spark to our proceedings. And thanks for your intriguing and thought-provoking piece of spoken word. A round of applause for our MCF. Youth Month is around the corner, so we'll be approaching you soon. To the management and staff, sorry, thanks to the individuals and groups who have contributed to the uplifting ambience of this opening ceremony. Your collective efforts will not only make this event unforgettable, but will have mirrored the high standards which aligns perfectly with the attributes of our council. Also, thanks to our host, the management and staff of Harbor Club, for the professional service you have provided in ensuring that we are comfortable and at peace. And so I speak for all as we look forward to the cocktail reception, which follows just in a few minutes. To the dedicated team behind the scenes, the event coordinators, Protocol officers, volunteers, administrative staff. I know my PS and my DPS, along with a secretary, um, worked very hard. Your attention to detail and commitment, and commitment to excellence, have contributed significantly to the seamless execution of this opening ceremony. Last but certainly not least, a heartfelt thank you to all invited guests here tonight, especially the delegates ministers, permanent secretaries, youth and, youth and sports directors, and all other distinguished guests and attendees who have traveled from various corners of the OECS region to be a part of this, of this gathering. Your engagement and enthusiasm are the driving force behind the success of this event, and we are excited to witness the magic that will result from our collective efforts. As we embark on the deliberations and discussions that lie ahead, let us carry with us the spirit of collaboration, innovation, and determination to make a lasting impact on the youth and sports landscape of the OECS. Together, we can build a future that empowers our youth and promotes the positive influence of sports in our societies and beyond the field. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lubon. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of this wonderful ceremony. I invite you to join us for refreshments, which will be served in the reception area to the front of this room. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Once again, I am Krista St. honored to be your chair of proceedings. Have a good evening, and please get home safely. Thank you.